I wrote 10, 20 articles, 10 for the Mexican viewpoint of the people, 10 from the government view, that is 10 from the U.S. Embassy viewpoint, the oil interests against the people. He suppressed the other side, he suppressed the people's side. And they were for $25,000. So I telegraphed this one thing I will say in favor of our Colonel McCormick. I said, these are forgeries. So he says, don't buy them. Three months later, they appear on the front page of the Hearst Press, sold them to Hearst for $25,000. A pure fraud, done by whom? By Ford, General Motors, Chrysler? Well, at that time, the press was so corrupt, you might say. I mean, I'm talking of a period of 50, 60 years that there was no mention of these things. They will never forgive me. The one thing they won't forgive is a critic of the press, apparently. The last of our series of programs on George Seldes, America's premier press muckraker, tonight on Alternative Views. George Seldes is a man who's lived in the shadows of American journalism, a giant living in the shadows of American journalism. Why haven't you heard of him? Well, for most of his journalistic career, he's been, you might call it, a marked man. Boycotted, blacklisted by the American press establishment. Why? Well, he went after the press itself. He was the press's critic talking about examples of press censorship. Uh, Colonel McCormick was the editor of the Chicago Tribune, the supposed owner also. Actually, it's owned by the Medill Trust, which owned the New York Daily News and the Chicago Tribune and Liberty Magazine and uh, other things. Well, anyway, Colonel McCormick sent me to Mexico, and I thought, well, look, this is a situation seems to have two sides to it. There's a religious quarrel going on. Uh, they're the labor unions, you see. They're the oil workers who are fighting the labor union, all that. I will write 10 articles, uh, or I'll take 10 subjects. Uh, the oil workers, the hacienda, the, the estates, uh, uh, the religious question, the shooting up of trains, the terrorists, and all like that. I will write that from what I know, I got a lot of my information from Ernest Greening, who afterwards became, he was a, a labor man, and there was somebody there from the American Federation of Labor organizing the Mexican workers. What was his name? Oh, he's quite a well-known person. Anyway, well, these are the Americans I was with to get the Mexican side, you see. On the other hand, the, the ambassador was out. There was Arthur Lane Wilson, was charge d'affaires, and he was really one of the worst. I mean, when I mentioned people like uh, this uh, uh, AFL head, uh, one of the heads, Greening and the rest, he says, skunks, liars, they're just reds or something like that, he yelled at me, you see. And at the same time, he had in his safe these fake Russian, do uh, uh, the, these fake documents of an American, of, of a, a plot you see, which, um, which a man named Avila, who was a, an agent, you see, was trying to sell us that five American senators, you see, were in, in, in a plot to establish a communist regime. Senators like uh, La Follette, you know, people like that. They had the documents, and I saw them. 
You see, we went to the embassy and this spotted named Avil and got them out and laid handed it to him. And so he says, you see, this is from the, the minister of war, you see. Do you know what? The first thing I saw was, it said uh, uh, something, Ministry of Petroleum, typed out, a uh, Ministry of Education, typed out, and, uh, and the word Ministry of War typed across or something like that. So when I went to see Greening and the rest about it, they said, well, of course they're forgeries. I said, they were even written in bad Spanish because Avila is a Texan. And his Spanish is learned Spanish. He can't even speak decent Spanish. And he himself probably wrote them, you see. And they were for $25,000. So I telegraphed this one thing I will say in favor of our Colonel McCormick. I said, these are forgeries. So he says, don't buy them. Three months later, they appear on the front page of the Hearst Press, sold them to Hearst for $25,000. Well, to get back to why I quit the Tribune and wrote a book, I wrote 10, 20 articles, 10 from the Mexican viewpoint of the people, 10 from the government view, that is 10 from the U.S. Embassy viewpoint, the oil interests against the people. He suppressed the other side, he suppressed the people's side. See? I wrote 20 you have another story, by the way, on yeah. Colonel McCormick yeah. as a, as you say, he's one of the most world famous xenophobes. Would you yeah. tell that story? Oh, Colonel McCormick? Yes. You want to hear a story about him? Yes. But I will illustrate you. I will illustrate the kind of man he was. He hated, although he was the son of an ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Russia during the 1905 war, by the way. The son of an ambassador. Uh, he hated everything European. He hated, I think, even anything American outside of what he called Chicago land. He was a xenophobe that was really a, a, a provincial to, the, to his own section, Chicago. Well, Floyd Gibbons was our main roving correspondent. The roving correspondent, there's only one job on every great organization like it. You can go wherever you want. You can go into anybody else's territory. You get double pay, and you're free. And if expense come, nothing. It's famous. Floyd Gibbons was the roving correspondent. And they decided to fire Floyd Gibbons for certain reasons. Uh, he called us together at the Ritz Hotel. We had dinner, and then we went up to a room, and we were, say, 18 or car 7, 15, 8, whatever it is, that, you know, one, uh, Berlin, Rome, Paris, and so forth, you know. I don't think we were maybe more than 10 because the Tribune wasn't as big as the Times, which may have had 50 men in Europe, including assistants. Anyway, he said, how many of you people uh, speak French? Well, if we were 12, I'm sure 10 raised their hand, because after all, it's the international language. How many of you speak German? Well, I was Berlin correspondent, so four, you see. Uh, how many of you speak Spanish? Perhaps one. And uh, the colonel sort of looks around, and then he points, and he says, I have decided to name Larry Rue chief roving correspondent. Now, Ra Larry was a bright boy and a fine boy and all like that. He flew his own aeroplane. Uh, but someone said, Colonel, Larry is the only one who doesn't speak any foreign languages. And the colonel says, that's the man I'm looking for. I don't want my bright American boys ruined by these goddamn foreigners. That's what, he, that's what he actually said to us. You know, I'll tell you a joke about the colonel. The, the colonel came to Paris. As I said, I was in the press section of the army, so during the Versailles treaty making, I went to Paris to see what was going. I traveled with Woodrow Wilson for three days and things like that. The colonel, who was in the fifth, but I mean, he was a big shot, you know. After all, he was the supposed owner of the Tribune, although he was the lieutenant colonel of artillery of the fifth artillery of the first division. He came to Paris, and we used to have little meetings at the Maurice Hotel, which was press headquarters and all like that, and the word got around. Do you know what Colonel McCormick asked? He said, he, said, he thought the Ukraine was a musical instrument. This was at the making of the Versailles Treaty. George, there's a lot of people in the labor movement today feel that they get a bad deal in the press. 
in fact, exposed a good deal of the history of anti-labor bias. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about that? Uh, uh, I mean, look, the anti-labor bias has always been in the newspapers, no matter what they pretend to be. I mean, in every, in every city, as a rule, there'd be one paper that perhaps would be a little bit liberal, like the leader, my paper in Pittsburgh, where I started. That's why I started on, because it's going to be a, li a liberal paper. There's a labor paper. Labor unions did get notices. We had a labor editor, you see. But the gang, the, the bosses, the banks really own the paper, you see. Now, actually, how, how I got started with, after, after the Spanish War, a magazine called Can got started, then one called Friday. This was all in which we were all looking for somewhere to tell the truth or the facts, if you don't like the word truth. We couldn't. So that one, I said, how did I start my paper? I figured out there was only one way to start. We happened to know a man who was connected with some union. And we said, look, we're going to start this paper. We're going to publish all the news that's suppressed. A large part of it is suppressed news. A large part of it is concerns labor. Now, to get some, we'll get you a, some, a sample dummy, and we're going to make a low price, say 25 cents for 12 issues, sample issues. And he went out to the labor unions of New York City. And the day we started, in fact, the first issue of May 1940, we had 6,000 subscribers. Before we were started, all were union men. Now, we got, eventually, we, we were starting towards a million. I had a maximum of 176,000 subscribers. Uh, and I would have gotten a million if it wasn't for the red baiting. People wrote in saying, uh, if you can mail it in a plain envelope, so no one will know what I'm getting. I'd like to get your magazine, something like that. George, tick off a few of the things that you try to expose in your uh, weekly, in fact, that the establishment press were uh, uh, ignoring. For instance, look, we found out that the Federal Trade Commission what is and always has been a sort of the watchdog for the health and welfare of the American people. Uh, Drugs, tobacco, uh, even even car uh, financing. Uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission, we found out, issues more than 365 what we generally call fraud orders a year. They issue stipulations, they issue... Um, Anyway, they even have trials and court decisions, whatever it is, you see. Orders, whatever it is. Well, at that time, the press was so corrupt, you might say. I mean, I'm talking of a period of 50, 60 years that there was no mention of these things. There was no mention when a, 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 a dollar a bottle thing to cure tuberculosis, consumption cure would be put on the market. A pure fraud. But there were big frauds done by whom? By Ford, General Motors, Chrysler? You, will you believe it? Well, look, this is a simple little matter. They have a fine, each of the, comp, each of the big dealers has a financing department. You can buy a $3,000 car, which was big money in those days, see? Financing it for three years, for 6%. Fair enough, right? This is what the fraud order says. During the year, you paid $180 the first year, 6% on $3,000. And the second year, you have paid off $1,000. You only owe $2,000. But the financing department of General Motors or CIT, which was Ford's or the other, would say $180 the second year. The third year, you only owe $1,000. But you're paying $180, that's 18% interest. So it averages out to 12% interest. So the fraud order by the FTC ad addressed to Ford General Motors, I don't know if I have, I may have it in here, the a photostat of it. And all the rest says you cannot claim 6% when you, under these circumstances. It's 6% on the balance due and not on the original price of the car. 
And do you know millions of people paid it and still thought they were paying only 6% for financing their car? And another issue you took up, certainly ahead oh. of your time, another issue you took up, certainly ahead of your time, certainly ahead of the uh, uh, Surgeon General's report, 1964, oh, yes. was smoking. What did, in fact, do well, about smoking? Look, as I always said, the three greatest powers in this country, so far as the press are concerned, are automobiles, because they're the three biggest group advertisers. Automobiles, uh, tobacco, drugs, and cosmetics. Now, you, can you think of anybody? That, I don't know. That's bigger. I mean, oil doesn't add. Well, oil is uh, oil doesn't have to advertise. Uh, groceries, no. I mean, a lot of groceries advertise, but no. This, these are the three biggest three groups. They, always, you know, they they appear in editor and publisher. It's the 50 largest groups of advertisers and what they spent this year, hundreds of millions each year. And one, two, three, one, three, two, three, one, two. These three are always the first three. They never vary very well. My claim was, and we, I think we proved it, and in fact, that each of these three corrupted the press or had an influence the press, that just as this faking of this three, six percent on the cars that the press would never show it up and would not print the fraud orders when they were issued. We printed them. Especially when we found out we could get one every day. If I was short of a story, I'd always get a fraud order story, see? Now, there, were, there was... Tobacco came about in this way. Uh, this... This, the tobacco story, I started before I started, in fact, because in 1938, Dr. Pearl, of the head biologist of Johns Hopkins, came out with a little pamphlet which he sent me. Uh, it was called Tobacco Smoking and Longevity. In 1939, a man named Ickes, who was the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, an ex-newspaper man, and whom I knew fairly well. And he called me up or wrote to me and said, look, I am having a debate with Frank Gannett of the Gannett chain. I think it is one of the biggest chains in the world. And today it is a rather good chain of newspapers, showing you that the press is a better press when a great chain like Gannett does something pro bono publico, you know the general welfare, very well. He's having a debate on town meeting of the air, which meant 10 million American listeners in 1939 on the press. And he said, I, he is taking the side of the press and I'm the critic of the press. Now give me some episodes to which to have documentation on my charges. So I said, well, of course, you know, everybody knows about the escalator that broke and three or four people were dragged and killed at either Macy's or Gimbel's. And no Macy or Gimbel story of that time ever would get in the paper. Of course, in my hometown, there was a rape case where the owner of the department store used to rape the girls and they had to keep quiet, didn't get in the papers. When one girl sued and was suppressed, the Philadelphia paper, published a story and brought it to Pittsburgh, a different thing. Well, um, I said, these stories are always being suppressed, you see. Now, I happen to know that Dr. Pearl, the head of Johns Hopkins Medical, addressed the New York State Medical Association here in New York City, and nothing appeared in the papers about it. So, in the questioning period, you see, they asked for Mr. Ickes, what proof have you? And he went and he mentioned, you know, an elevator breaks down or kills somebody or a little accident in the escalator in a department store, never gets in the paper, something like that. Or a fraud order against some goods that they sold, never gets into the paper. Those are ordered almost every week or every day, as I told you. And then, of course, there's the case of smoking. And then he enlarged a bit on this, you see. And what happened afterwards was, you might say, even worse than the original suppression. The New, the, uh, the New York Herald Tribune, which had never mentioned Dr. Pearl's visit to New York at all, came out with a headline saying, Ickes lies again. 
This was the headline. Then it said, of course, Ickes may not be to blame because look at the unreliable source he has. See, B, because by this time I had already written four books critical of the press and I had already had orders that I was never to be mentioned anywhere. So when they chance to attack me, they attacked me, you see. Then the Times did something. Mr. James, my former colleague in the press section of the Army, did something. He took the 38 story, you see, which I said had been suppressed, because I thought it was suppressed. I didn't remember it in the Times. And sure enough, on page 16, one day, that, this story was covered as follows. Pearl didn't speak entirely about tobacco. He spoke about longevity. And he mentioned and he, hard work, you see. And the headline was a column story. There's most of a column. In the Times, hard work never hurt anybody, says Dr. Pearl. And that's what the story was about. Hard work was good for people, and in a way it is. If a person gives up work, you know, like people who retire, you know, they're, they're just looking toward the grave or something. I've always felt that way about people. Well, anyway, so James says, we did publish it, and he has marked in the last paragraph, it says, Dr. Pearl also showed some charts of the effect of smoking on longevity. It's just one paragraph, four or five lines, that's all it said. The main thing were these, he had these charts, you know, these things made up on great big charts and they frightened the life out of everybody. What were some of the other stories you covered in, in, in fact? What were I had one helper. I did all the writing. How can you get, every day we came out with investigative reports, with exposés and things like that. Where do you get it? I say frankly, I now can tell you that I never mentioned the name of anybody who sent me stuff. But now that they're dead, I mentioned. I said, Drew Pearson gave me one of the biggest stories of all. In the middle of, uh, I don't know, in the middle of the 19, toward 19, what, 40 to 50, in the middle of 1940, but several years after the war was over, we were, they revived the idea we may have to go to war with Russia. You see, well, someone had a brilliant plan of going by the North Pole uh, and training troops in, uh, in, uh, through Canada. Drew Pearson got the story. It was called Operation Muskox for the training of special snow troops to cross, to cross over into Russia, which would be a terrific surprise attack. Drew was afraid he might go to jail if he published it. So he sent it to us, and we came out, Operation Muscox, Plans for a War. You see, and all like that. That's one story. How about the role of the, uh, uh, of the American uh, Legion? That's probably the... Uh, well, look. You did yeah, expose... I mean, of all the sacred cows in the... I mean, there are certain things which is known as, uh, as the sacred cows in the press. I mean, the, there's some... There's some... It's known as the sometimes known as the SOB list, you know. I, and there, there are things like that. And then there's a business of BOM list, business office must. I'm talking about the old days. Well, among the sacred cows of the press, I mean, there are certain things. You cannot mention any church, religion, preacher, rabbi, priest, anybody in trouble, even to this day. Tobacco was sacred. Certain patent medicines, the advertised the department stores were sacred. A lot of things are no longer sacred. The press today, I say, is billion times better than what it was. The American Legion always was one of the sacred idols of the press. I was in Europe. I'd just gotten a job for the Chicago Tribune, but I was not in Paris. The American Legion was organized in Paris. Yes, I was in Paris because I think it was before I was out of the army that the American Legion was organized in Paris in 1919. You see, I was in the Army till June 1919. I got the job back in September, October to go back to Europe at the time, you see, very well. Uh, the Legion was organized by a bunch of officers, including, uh, not, you know, it was Colonel 
Theodore uh, Roosevelt's son. Yes, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., whatever his name, son. Uh, also, the president of the Prudential Life Insurance. People like that who were officers. Uh, whatever else they were, they were the heads of corporations or corporation lawyers or people of that sort. Now, what was the purpose of founding the Legion? The purpose of, find, of founding the Legion was to end the unrest which might be caused by the soldiers returning to America. They were scared to what, of, of unrest. Of course, they put the red label on the unrest. Actually, they knew that the majority of them were working people. They would demand better conditions. They'd risk their lives. They were entitled to a better world. We were, they were promised a better world to live in. The phrase was common, all like that. So the idea was to form a patriotic group, you see, which would hold down any liberal or radical movement in America. That was the purpose. Now there were letters, of which I had one, and which I published later on, first on the stationery of Swift and Company, you see, which practically asks for contributions for that purpose, and all this and, and that was really what the purpose of the Legion. Now, <clears throat> nobody knows, for instance, that many years later, even, when the Legion had been accused of strike breaking. Now, uh, Haywood Broon, who founded the newspaper Guild in 33 or 34, he said the American Legion is the largest strike breaking force in America. He said that. General Smedley Butler of the Marines. He said, I've never known a, a, a leader of the Legion who didn't sell them out. Uh, the Legion had beautiful clubhouses in many cities, all supplied by the corporation heads and people like that. No one knows, because it was not published in anywhere but in the labor press, that many, many years after all this strike breaking, which the Legion engaged in, one of their commanders, his name was Calmery, commander in chief of the American Legion, issued an order, which was not published in the general press, which tells the Legion that in all strike breaking in the future could not be done anymore in Legion uniform, not even, not even the Legion cap which is an admission that they'd been breaking strikes up to then, isn't it, when he says to stop doing it in uniform? George, you mentioned the problem of red baiting and in fact finally succumbed to the whole tide of hysteria that was sweeping the country during the McCarthy period. What about your own relationship with Joe McCarthy? You were called before the committee. Why don't you give us uh, some of the, relay some of that experience? Well, uh, <clears throat> you see, we went out of business in 50. And I wasn't called before the McCarthy Committee in 1953. But just for a minute, I, want, I, I must tell you that at the end, it got so that letter, people said the letter carriers tell us that, that people are taking our names in the post office of all subscribers to your paper. Well, that was Martin Dye's work, I think, largely, because Martin Dye simply listed, in fact, as, as, as a... a, a uh, Subversive organization, something like that. Well, in 1953, uh, two guys named Cohn and Shine. One of them is Roy Cohn, now one of the leading attorneys in New York City. They took it upon themselves, or McCarthy sent them, and they went to they went to um, uh, Europe, and they came back with a list of 200 American authors. I think it was 200, at least 100, whose books appear on the USIS, United States Information Service, libraries there. And McCarthy took it upon himself, or maybe they gave him a list of those that they didn't like, but anyway, one after another of the people whose books appeared were called before the McCarthy Committee in Washington. Well, I think I was the last person for the day. I was called in. Uh, 
how do you swear, by the Bible or do you affirm? I said, I swear by the Bible. I put my hand, I raised it. And the lawyer for the, his name Roy Cohen says, have you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I say, never, absolutely not. Well, I heard, well, people sort of, uh, and then uh, Cohen says, but you're listed as one by the Dyes Committee. Would you say the Dyes Committee lies? I say, if the Dyes Committee says so, then they lie. Well, that sort of offended everybody. But I didn't mind the fact that I was being asked questions. But this lawyer was, uh, well, I won't, maybe libelous to what I think internally I will not say because it may be libelous. But this is what he did. After I took an oath that I'd never been a member of the Communist Party, which I'm willing to do it before the Supreme Court, I'm a registered Democrat. I voted a Republican ticket for Senator Aiken of Vermont because he's the best senator and all that. But anyway, during the hearings, suddenly this uh, attorney Cohn, but uh, he says you forgot to mention the name of the cell in Chicago and in, uh, in Connecticut of which you were a member. I said, what do you mean by cell, cell or something? You know, he said you were a member of a group. I said, no, I was a member of no group. I don't know what you're talking about. But you see, he tried to trap me. That I think is called entrapment or something. I mean, by uh, asking questions like this, you see. So at this point, Senator Symington say, well. What are your politics, Mr. Selvis? And I said to him, well, I live in Vermont. I have a home. I'm a registered Democrat in Vermont. But I say, this is for the primaries. But at the election time, I have always voted for a friend, the man from who I used to buy flowers from. His name is George Aiken, has the best nursery at Putney, Vermont. And I vote the Republican Aiken and the rest of the ticket Democrat. He says, one of us said Symington, who turned out to be a Democrat. That sort of knocked the, the, the hearing out pretty well. Well, there were some more questions, you see. Oh, yes, uh, shall I tell you about J.B. Matthews' question about the Catholic Church? Well, I'll tell you about that. Uh, Matthews, who was their investigator, you see, suddenly uh, interposes and says, yes, but you wrote a book against the Catholic Church. Well, I mean, technically, you can write a book about for or anti a church. It's not treasonable, is it, or uh, subversive? Anyway, I said, oh, I said, uh, I said, uh, Mr. Matthews, if you're referring to the Vatican yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, Harper suggested I translate a book, and I did a translation, but I threw it away and supplied my own stuff. My wife did some of the work. And uh, it appeared under our names, and the Catholic Book Club took it as their monthly choice, the Catholic Book of the Month Club book. Well, <laughs> that ended that, you see. Well, after a while, McCarthy says, you wait outside, I have somebody else to talk to, see, and I'll call you later. And then the colored man walks in, and I wait and wait and wait, sitting with the AP, UP, Washington Post and other men, they weren't allowed in the meetings, you see. To, you see, if anybody refused, took the Fifth Amendment or refused or something like that, they'd be held over for a public hearing the next day with the movies, the bright lights, and everything else, you know. They made a show of this thing. So I'm talking to these people, and suddenly the door opens, McCarthy, Symington, the whole staff, Cohen, Matthews, they all walk out, and I sort of said, Senator, you said, oh, he says, and then he says to these people, Freeman and Seldes are cleared. I said, well, I said, uh, Senator, I, I, you don't, probably don't realize it, but I'm here voluntarily. I didn't have to come. He says, like hell, he said, you were subpoenaed. I sent the FBI after you. I said, well, I said, uh, Senator, look at the uh, subpoena. There was a subpoena, you know, of the committee of whatever it is, and where it was supposed to be signed, Joe McCarthy, it was blank. It was the carbon. The secretary, by mistake, had sent me the carbon, the original signed. He, 
McCarthy says, I'll clear this for you, and signs it Joe McCarthy and hands it to me. I lost it. I don't know where it is, but it's a good, be a fine document. Maybe it's in Pennsylvania at the university. Well, George, that was, uh, that was 1953. Yeah. What have you been doing with yourself for the last 25 years? Writing books about the press mm -hmm. and getting suppressed by the press. Are you bitter about that? No, I'm not. Well, I mean, look, I'm glad to say that the press today, <coughs> except on, on certain things, I mean, I still think that uh, uh, they will never forgive me. The one thing they won't forgive is a critic of the press, apparently. At least I know that from my case. Look, if, if you are publishing, if a book is published, and if 300 leading newspapers and the 300 well-known book reviewers are sent copies and not one newspaper in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Pittsburgh, Chicago mentions the book, even mentions it. Don't you think that it's, it's more than a, uh, a slip? After They have a lot of books to review. But I've had some bestsellers, you know, in the old days, and yet there was not one. There were three papers mentioned this review out of 300 leading papers. The Houston Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Hawaii, what the leading paper of Honolulu, the Times Union or the oh, Union yeah. News or whatever it is. The leading paper of Hawaii, and this is what they did. They attacked me. It wasn't a favorable review. It was an attack. Now, you got the book there anywhere? In, in this book, even the gods cannot change history. My whole idea is to say that history is reported wrong, and this is a correction from personal experience. One of the chapters there says, the Versailles Treaty was, and the League of Nations was all ruined because the Chicago Tribune got an advanced copy and a man named Fraser Hunt gets all the credit for taking the, the copy and risking being arrested or something. After all, we were still, the piece that I don't think had been signed. You see, I know now where we got it from. I only found out a few years ago. We got it from Eugene Chen, the Chinese delegate. <coughs> anyway. There were 30 copies of the treaty, and this was one of them, of the 30 leading nations, each had only one copy. And the, the Chinese delegate slipped it to us. Well, it was Spearman Lewis. My whole point is Spearman Lewis is, did the greatest, it's called the greatest scoop in the history of the world. That's what it was called. The Times, the Chicago Tribune, they ran four solid pages of the text of the treaty. You know of any other story that had four solid pages of type? I don't know of nothing. I know of nothing, not even the armistice, the end of the war. I mean, different stories, yes, but one item. And this was used to raise opposition to the huh? treaty. This was used well, to raise opposition to well, the treaty. Well, look, so my whole point is Spearman Lewis, is, I want to give him his honor, and Fraser Hunt happened to be going home and carried it in his suitcase. It was Spearman Hunt was the editor of the Paris edition, the Tribune, at that time and 1919, you see. And this was his great story. So the, so when I read this attack on me in this Hawaiian paper, this Honolulu paper, I noticed that the man said, he does, however, give credit where credit is due. He credits uh, Fraser Hunt with bringing the treaty to America. In other words, the guy had opened it up and read one paragraph and hadn't read the story that Fraser Hunt is getting the credit and deserves nothing. It was Spearman Lewis's treaty. So he missed the whole point. So I wrote to the editor, see? So the editor had a column, you see, in which I say, well, of course, your reviewer didn't read the book. And it's not noted and notorious that reviewers do not read books. They cannot read books. They haven't got time to read the books to review. And this man has done this. So they ran my letter, but they ran a reply from him saying, nevertheless, you see, some attack on me of some sort. As a person who spent a, a lifetime, more than 70 years now, as a vocal and persistent critic of the press, 
Have you seen much progress over that 70 yes. years? So, I mean, when I say the press is better today, I mean, you take the, the people who suppress things, the advertisers, the automobiles, tobacco, patent medicines. Today, medicines are discussed, fraud orders are discussed, bad automobiles are discussed, uh, and certainly tobacco is it's still, it's not quite a sacred cow, but it's still being discussed. I mean, there's still something that appears in the paper when something is done, like when the government issues a report. It may not appear on the front page where it should appear, but it does appear. So, as a person who cursed the darkness for so many years, you see some light now. Well, I mean, there's no question that things are better now. You know, Frank, that's a remarkable man we've just seen. Uh, in an era when uh, uh, the press themselves have been uh, become celebrities, he's really uh, an unknown giant of American journalism. Oh, that's true. I, I have such strange feelings about, about this program and him because, as you know, I've been doing research into press criticism and the American power structure for several years now, uh, seven or eight years. And although the name George Seldes was not unfamiliar, it was just a name. I, I didn't have any idea that this man was such a giant, such a neglected giant. And reading these back issues of, in fact, there's a gold mine of information there that I, uh, I'm, I'm just staggered by. It. Well, it's, it's a poignant commentary, and I only ran across him by, uh, by accident, Frank. I was about five or six years ago doing some research on how uh, working people and specifically unions have been treated in the press and I ran across his name. And about a year and a half ago I I called him up uh, in Vermont never really expecting that uh, I'd even find him. And I called up and said uh, hello uh, George Seldes and he says yes. I said is this the George? And he interrupted me and said, yes, I'm still alive. <laughs> well, he's still alive. We could see that by the, uh, just the vibrancy of the man. It, it really kind of, he just exudes warmth and vitality. He's 90 years old now, but you'd really never know it, as I'm sure the viewers can tell from uh, just the, the tape. What amazes me is that he's still working. He's in there clipping, making clippings and everything still. Is he still writing? What's his life like? Well, he's still writing, yeah. Uh, he's in, I guess, semi-retirement, although he really ob objects to the word retirement. He just <laughs> sees that as, you know, uh, as, uh, akin to, you know, death. He, he's, uh, he's a worker. He's, he, he spends, uh, he, all, he spent about 45 years in Vermont, and now uh, Vermont winters are a little tough for him, so he... Um, spends the winter down at his cousin place in, out on Long Island, Watermill, New York, where uh, that's where the interview took place. Oh. It was a year ago, uh, last April. What about his background? How did he grow up? What were his parents like? Well, his, uh, it's interesting. His, he was born in 1890, and uh, his father was a uh, self-proclaimed self philosophical anarchist. He read the works of people like Kropotkin and Tolstoy. And Seldes himself grew up on a utopian communal farm. And he recalls that the air was thick with political debate. And he remembers uh, people like Emma Goldman traveling through and Maxim Gorky and all other names from the, uh, from Rus from the Russian Revolution. Um, the boarded revolution of 1905. Uh, Seldes himself uh, wanted always to be an artist, and it's kind of been a, uh, an avocation of his. And where was this? Uh, this was in New Jersey. He was born in New, in New Jersey. Jersey. Right. And there were collective uh, type uh, farms in New Jersey. Right. And uh, his father, to make a living, had to give up the farm, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, he became a pharmacist in Philadelphia. And, and George was raised by a, uh, an aunt for the most part. Uh, he said she was one of these modern women. She smoked it all and all that. <laughs> uh, what amazes me about the situation, I, I was jolted when he was talking about the McCarthy situation. Yeah. So many people with Selda's background mm -hmm. were really pilloried by McCarthy and, all, and his ilk. Uh, people who did actually much less in a way than Seldes did. 
that's still a curious question. Do you have a feel for that? Well, I don't know. Seldes is a difficult person to pin down. He, um, I think he was just real elusive before the committee and was able to kind of, um, well, he, he has a kind of uh, warmth about him that can disarm people. And I think he had that effect on the committee itself. I'm wondering if the fact that he was purely a journalistic muckraker rather than a dynamic activist had something to do with it. Yeah, I don't know where the line between, you know, being a, a purely journalistic muckraker and a dynamic activist is. I mean, he sh his work sure uh, ended up uh, being the ammunition for a whole lot of other people who were in the fray. I guess that's the evi the value of a muckraker, then. Isn't it? That's the value of the muckraker. Uh, you know, uh, and from other sources, uh, Ralph Nader says that at age 14 he began devouring, in fact, and and uh, in fact had a, a great influence on him. Daniel Ellsberg recalls reading it. A uh, Jack Anderson, the col muckraker columnist of this uh, generation, said he cut his teeth. On, uh, on George Seldes's work. I.F. Stone, whose own weekly um, uh, came after uh, George Seldes, uh, said he got the mailing list from, from, from Seldes when, uh, uh, in fact, end up closing up shop in 1950. Uh, in fact, Carrie McWilliams, the now late editor of The Nation, says that Seldes is clearly one of the top 10 greatest muckrakers in the history of America. But other names, people like Upton Sinclair and Ralph Nader and, and the like, well, they're known, but he's, he's lived in the shadows. Seldes has lived in the shadows. I think he feels a little bitter about that. I don't think he lets on about that. Until this day, still, yeah. this giant in our midst is ignored by the media. Correct. Whereas Nader and all these other people still get uh, a lot of attention. Well, he obviously... Uh, uh, ran interference for these people in a time when it was much more difficult. Like, for instance, I, I think a lot of the stories you now see uh, about uh, the trust and big business, I mean, you don't have to watch 60 Minutes or uh, ABC's 2020 or documentaries or, for that matter, even the evening news to see that these stories are becoming fairly routine, uh, that kind of muckraker. But when Seldis started out, it was akin to professional suicide for a reporter to touch those kinds of stories. And he did it, and that took tremendous courage. Are you saying then you agree with Seldes when he said that the press is much better today than it used to be? Oh, I think at uh, exposing, well, we only have to look at it. I mean, Three Mile Island, nuclear power, uh, workplace accidents, um, uh, Keypone, uh, the Pinto, the defects in the Pinto. I think these kinds of things get um, a fairly uh, wide exposure on television today. But I think it's more subtle today than it used to be. Last, uh, when in his time, they would just either ignore it or severely uh, distort it. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they, the media do, they mention something like that, but the distortion and the censorship is, is more subtle. Uh, still, the press back in the 40s and 30s would have been outraged even at what uh, exposes there are in the press today, but it's still far different. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a need for an alternative press like we do today. Well, yeah, clearly, but we have a different agenda to work with. I mean, uh, his times, the, the issues were a hell of a lot more clear-cut and black and white. Uh, as now where I think we're dealing with um, the problem that, okay, so, um, so keep home, the dangers of uh, chemicals in the food do get a play on the evening news. That's a minute and a half out of a 22-minute broadcast once in a while, and a lot of these stories get lost in the garbage. Absolutely. Uh, well, I can think of, for instance, uh, the recent Metcalf Committee expose showing the interlocking directorates mm -hmm. and the uh, great concentration of ownership of the... Uh, of a few investors, 21 investors controlling the major uh, corporations in the country, and the interlocking directorates among all this. CBS Evening News was the only one that had anything on it. it was 30 seconds on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Now, this to me is the difference. They may say a little bit, but that's all. Mm -hmm. And there are things like uh, in Selda's uh, headlines about the concentration camps that are in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
This isn't talked about on the regular media, although a recent uh, article in seven days, well, recent within the last year, talked about that the concentration camps in the United States are still in existence. So it isn't as black and white, like you say, as it used to be. Yeah, well, I don't think it's like anything else. I think we should, uh, in many ways, uh, pat or give ourselves and those that came before us, like, like George Seldes, who got us to the middle of the mountain. But it's our, our task, our existential task, our political task, to keep climbing up to the top of the mountain. <laughs> okay. We'll take our oxygen and, <laughs> and well, that's our... That's a long, hard road march. Our fly, and our but flight got, jackets but, with us. But people like that got us there, and they inspire us to, to move on. And they should get the recognition they, they deserve yes. and appreciation. Yes. I enjoyed the story. You know, there are a lot of anti-McCarthy people who say, I give McCarthy a square deal. I'll tell the truth. I hate him. I exposed him. I said he was a crook. He was a crook as a tail gunner. He took money that he didn't declare in his income tax. There was a, a union man who was going to organize legion posts of only union men to counteract them. And he, he was one of the people who worked with, in fact, for several years. Ten-year history, we cooperated with the labor unions. Uh, the CIO news, Len Decola, he just was talking about it. I mean, we sent them news, they sent us news. Uh, the railroad workers had a paper called Labor, you know. The railroad workers are sort of the aristocrats of Labor, but they always, uh, Keating was the editor. He was one of my great friends. We always cooperated. Uh, Buckminster, was that the name? The, Rubber, United Rubber Workers, Akron. Then came the oil workers in Texas, you see. Now, they did something. This la these labor people did something no one else did for us. 
I don't know, we were never asked them, anyone to do it, but they came across and said, we are taking, at that time it was only 50 cents a year, for 50 copies I'll have you know, we're taking 50 cents out of the annual pay of our union dues. Well, they probably took two other things for other things, didn't they? It's a, it's, it's a system of, yeah, but, and I don't think labor likes very it's a much. Check off. Huh? It's a dues check off. Yes. It's an assessment. That's about 50 cents for a year. And you will get a weekly publication, see, devoted to our side. Well, it so happened that we so had, we had always one third, one third of our subscribers was labor unions. When we had ten, when we had thirty thousand, they were ten. When we had one hundred and seventy-six thousand, we had fifty, sixty thousand for labor. There's no question of it. Now, we had how many oil workers, CIO, were there in Texas? I don't know. We had Port Arthur. We had Tidewater. I remember when one union after another, we'd get a block. You see, fifty cents for so many hundred people per each. You divide sums of money, and we eventually had thousands. But practically every union man and every oil union man in Texas was one of my readers. A man I think his name was Knight was the president of the oil workers union. He would send me he would send me telegrams. Send me everything you have about the past history of labor as concerning the Tidewater Oil Company or Gulf or whatever the Texas companies were. And of course I'd send it to him and so. Forth. Trace back the word conservative all the way back, you know, and see what people have said about it, you know. I mean, how people dare call themselves conservative. If only uh, they knew that all the way back to Greek and Roman times, and certainly in all the, all the leaders whom everybody uh, looks up to today, their views of conservative. Conservatives have, they've conserved what? The status quo they've conserved, they've conserved their wealth, their status, and all like that. They've done nothing for progress. All the progress in the world has been made by anti-conservatives. Well, do you know what Bertolt Brecht said about conservatism? He no, said, is it a good quote? You write it out for me. Well, he says, by nature I'm a conservative man. It's, ra it's capitalism that makes me a radical. That's, very, that's a brilliant, brilliant, yes. I have a short postscript to our program series on George Seldes. Our original taping of the interviews with him was made two years ago when he was 90 years old. And I've just found out that a new book is coming out on the market. It is an expose, a muckraking expose on public relations in the United States. And the author is 92-year-old George Seldes.